I'm Chris Motes, and welcome to The Good Life. Around our kitchen table, we talk about the stuff that matters. So pull up a chair as we visit with real people and talk about love and loss, sacrifice and salvation. At this kitchen table, we don't have all the answers, but we do believe that life is good. And we want you to hear the stories of everyday heroes living the good life. This is episode two, and as I explained last week, on this show, we think that life's good. It's worth talking about, the stuff that makes it worth living. But we also know that each one of us can be a mixed bag. We want to talk about the real stuff, heartache and tears and all. So it's our commitment to have conversations with respect and love, but also to not shy away from the things that matter at your kitchen table. So grab a chair, pour a cup of coffee, and let's dive in to the good life. Hey, this episode, we are going to visit with Katie Glenn Daniels. Katie is a whip smart lawyer and a friend of mine. She works at an organization called Susan B. Anthony Pro Life America. Hey, Katie, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Katie, before we, we jump in just to the conversation today, um, not that, I mean, this isn't a history program, but Susan B. Anthony. I mean, the, the namesake of your organization, uh, I, I think that, you know, high school civics was a long time ago for a lot of us. Um, refresh our memories. Who is Susan B. and, and why is she, uh, she so important even today? Susan B. Anthony is, of course, best known as leading um, the first wave feminists, the group of suffragists who uh, fought for women's rights in our country. So... Um, primarily that was the right to vote, but it was also things like participation in civic life, um, the ability to, for, of a woman to hold, um, her own money and, um, and a lot of the women that she surrounded herself with her contemporaries, um, were also very pro-life, although they wouldn't have necessarily called themselves that the terminology pro-life wasn't there, uh, but they wrote extensively about um, issues of both women and children. And at that time, a husband could force his wife to have an abortion in some places. It was not her decision at all. Um, And so this was really an issue that the early suffragists were thinking about as they thought about what does equality for women mean? Um, They saw the right to life for women's children (laughs) as a key component of that. Um, And Alice Paul, one of her contemporaries, famously said, abortion is the ultimate exploitation of women. Mm. So when our organization was founded uh, 30 years ago, she was a great namesake for us uh, because we wanted to get back to those first principles of what it means to have equality in our society. That's 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 beautiful. And just like to to, to give a sense of the span of history, I think we're talking like 1820s, 1830s. I mean, so this is 200 years ago, going back um, this really wonderful, dynamic, powerful woman who's who's leading the charge on on so many like civil rights issues um, and including, as you point out, um, you know, just saying life is good from the moment of conception uh, and, the, and the rights of women to, uh, to safeguard that right. Tell us a little bit, uh, Katie, just about the sort of work that you do at Susan B. Anthony. So our organization um, was founded as a political animal. Uh, Marjorie Dannenfelser, uh, one of our founders, was a staffer in Congress who looked around and said, we're never going to pass any pro-life policies if we don't have pro-life people here Mm. in this building. Mm. Um, So we really did start our life um, with the ethos of electing and championing pro-life lawmakers who can take our values into Washington, D.C. and into state capitals. Um, Today, what that looks like um, is a much more expanded vision, especially post Dobbs decision, where we have a government affairs team that is actively working towards uh, protecting life everywhere that we can in every way that we can. So since the Dobbs decision in 2022, we now have 24 states that are protecting life um, at 15 weeks when science shows that babies can feel pain or sooner. Of course, South Dakota is one of those that was ready to go. Um, And as soon as that Dobbs decision came down, South Dakota was protecting life from conception. Um, And we're so happy (laughs) to have our partners um, and friends that we have worked on this mission 
with. Um, we also have a huge part of our organization that's growing on the C3 nonprofit side called Her Plan that's all about connecting women and the organizations that help them, whether it's churches or pregnancy centers, with uh, the resources they need. So we know that if a woman goes into Planned Parenthood, they see the baby as the problem. And, and if she aborts that baby, she, she doesn't have a baby, but she ha still has the problem, whatever it is, whether it's a financial need, um, yeah. she's having trouble in school, she's in a yeah. bad relationship, the problem is still there. Uh, getting rid of the baby did not solve it. So her plan is really oriented around uh, making sure women have a place where they can find the resources, whatever it is, and helping organizations understand their role in the pro-life safety net. So it's things like food banks, legal aid, um, her problem, you know, could be many, any number of things and we really want to help address that. So that's not the team I'm on, but it's the part of our organization that's growing the fastest. And I'm very excited um, when I get to share it with people. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And it, and it really just highlights the, I mean, what's what's at the core of this is love and relationships, right? So it's, it's beautiful to see uh, your organization moving that way. You know, and... I appreciate you, you know, full disclosure, Susan B. Anthony, political animal, really um, sees the importance of law and policy. Um, but I also think that so many times, uh, especially we're in an election year, we all know that, uh, no more car commercials. It's all going to be like political messaging coming up here real soon, uh, Labor Day is that, that big drop. But th there are always stories of real people. And Katie, I want to know your story. Like what motivated you uh, to get into the work that you do? And, you know, why do you hold uh, the values that you do? Well, I would say um, there are really two things. I am very strongly personally pro-life um, because my family has a stake in this. Um, my cousin, who is just seven or eight weeks younger than me, um, is one of the oldest living people in the world with a heart condition that when we were born over 30 years ago was a death sentence. Mm. Um, my aunt and uncle were told we can try this surgery. We don't know if it will work. And they said, you know, <laughs> if this is in God's hands, like we got to do it. And um, he is now a pediatrician who treats other kids with similar conditions. He is also a father and a husband, and he's living such a great, meaningful life. And he says, I want to speak out about this because when other families get this diagnosis, they go to Google and I want them to see my story. I want them to see yeah. that I have a good life and that there yeah. is hope. So this has always been personal to me sure. um, because that is the kind of kid that people push parents towards abortion. I cannot imagine yeah. um, the pressure that my aunt and uncle would be under today because yeah. now this can be identified through the ultrasound. Um, the second thing is that as a first year law student, I read all these court cases. I read Roe v. Wade. I read Casey. And I said, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Uh, these cases are arbitrary. You're deciding that on one day a person's a person, but the day before they weren't. And it's completely up to the doctor with a financial motivation to make that decision. It just doesn't make sense. And so I had a very clear sense of the ethics of the issue of abortion and human and human personhood um, but reading the case law with a very liberal professor <laughs> um, just exposed how arbitrary and meaningless the legal distinctions we were making were uh, there was no weight behind them and yet there was all the weight in the world behind them because this was life and death for 60 million americans who have been aborted since roe versus wade yeah so i was enormously grateful um, several years ago to get to join the pro-life movement and be an attorney who gets to use that education um, to fight for unborn babies and their moms full time. Well, th thank you for sharing this, the, the really beautiful story of your cousin, your aunt and uncle making this choice despite this um, in utero diagnosis that was not good at all, which I think, you know, we can all understand that there's just a lot of fear um, I don't know where this narrative comes from, if it's like a Hollywood or or media, but it's not, I don't, I don't know that most normal people would think that, but for this narrative that like women need need abortion, um, which is kind of brings us to where, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about today is just 
manipulation, coercion, what women really want. Can you tell us, Katie, um, the story of Catherine Herring? Who's Catherine? So Catherine Herring is a Texas woman who um, was pregnant with her third child last year, and um, her husband was having an affair. And he said, um, you know, this baby is a real problem for me because I'm going to look like such a jerk. And that's not the word he used. (laughs) He used a four letter word that uh, is not safe for family program. But he said, I'm going to look really bad if I leave my wife with a new baby to go do what I want to do. So you got to get an abortion. And and she said, absolutely not. I won't do that. And uh, to take this into his own hands. He drove across our southern border and um, got abortion drugs um, in a pharmacy in Mexico. They, they live in Houston. And um, not once, but seven different times, he broke these drugs up and put them in water bottles and tried to give them to her. So the first time she drank it, she got very sick. Yeah. Um, she went to the hospital. She was actually, you know, so fortunately um, able to do abortion pill reversal and get that progesterone treatment to um, save her baby's life. But she was very suspicious of that water bottle. And um, she is a (laughs) sophisticated woman. She hired a personal investigator um, and was able to document that six other times her husband tried to give her water bottles that had these drugs in them. Um, And she got the police involved and praise the Lord, her baby survived. But that gave the the district attorney the ability to plead down this case. So her husband only got 180 days in jail, uh, which sounds crazy, right? He poisoned two people. Right. But because, thank the Lord, both of them lived, um, the consequences were very low. And so they are currently um, getting a divorce and, and she's spoken out. I know in the National Catholic Register and in some other publications um, about how when these drugs are easily available, they can become a tool of domestic abuse. Yeah. And um, her brother happens to be a state senator in Louisiana, and he was very fired up about, you know, this attack on his sister and on his niece. And he championed a law that Louisiana just passed um, that increases their penalties um, if you poison someone or otherwise coerce them um, to have an abortion. And also the state added abortion drugs to their controlled substances schedule um, because they said these are inherently dangerous um, for women and for unborn children. And they also have a likelihood of abuse um, because they are available now online thanks to um, the FDA changing those rules a few years ago. Um, They are a tool of abuse, and so we've got to take prescribing them seriously and make sure that um, that we're tamping down on that and not letting that happen here in our state. Is is Catherine's story, Catherine Herring, this this really heartbreaking story? And thank thanks be to God, she's okay. Is this an isolated incident or or is it a broader trend that that we need to be concerned about? Unfortunately, it's not an isolated incident and it feels like. we have really seen an influx of these stories in the last month, I would say. Uh, There's another story out of Washington State where a man was, um, he's being charged. He is a nurse practitioner, he, although his license has been suspended. Um, and he wrote these drugs to himself. He wrote a prescription to his own name and he um, forced them inside of his girlfriend is you know very violent very um, disgusting situation and he's being prosecuted Um, there's another prosecution i just heard about in uh, massachusetts where a man um, labeled these abortion drugs as a prenatal vitamin how sick is this his dad's an OB-GYN, and so he told his girlfriend um, who had said i will raise this baby without you he said i don't want this baby And she said, that's okay. I will have this baby without you. You don't have to be involved. And he said, no, you won't. So he flipped, he flipped it around said, okay, I'm so excited. Here are some prenatal vitamins from my dad, who's an OB-GYN. 
And she thought this is a little bit weird to get a pill bottle, but you know, his dad is a doctor. Um, and she literally gave herself the abortion drugs mm. because at, at his urging at, at his advice. Um, so, I mean, what a sick situation for him to talk her into taking these drugs. Um, and you know, he is being prosecuted as well. And, and that's a case where the baby sadly did not survive. Uh-huh. You know, just maybe a quick a quick tangent. I, these drugs were in the news. I don't know, was it a month or a couple months ago? Um, and the headlines were something along the lines of Supreme Court approves abortion pills. If, if for those of us who are maybe kind of just seeing that at the headline level, is that is that really what happened? Did the Supreme Court approve these pills, or can you help us understand what that decision was? That is not what happened. <laughs> Um, what the Supreme Court said was the group of doctors who had brought this case um, where they were challenging the FDA's rules that had said these drugs can be sent through the mail, these drugs can be prescribed to minors. Um, they said those rules do not align with the dangers that we're seeing. Uh, the FDA needs to have more regulation on these drugs because we as emergency room doctors are treating women who are getting hurt. Yeah. And so they brought this lawsuit and unfortunately... <clears throat> the Supreme Court um, said that they were not the right party to bring the lawsuit. So um, they dismissed it on the standing grounds of who can bring the suit. Um, They did not weigh into the merits of the case at all. So it's important to know that two lower courts, the district court and the appellate court, um, had both said they think these doctors win on the merits. They think these doctors are bringing a strong case that the FDA is doing the wrong things and that they are letting these dangerous drugs be out there in a way that hurts the public. Yeah. The Supreme Court didn't get into that issue. Um, And this case will continue because three state governments have joined the case. Um, The states of Kansas, Idaho, and Missouri have all joined this case and they said our citizens are being harmed and we want to defend them. So I know the headline said Supreme Court approves abortion drugs. That's not what happened at all. The Supreme Court just said these plaintiffs were the wrong people to bring the case. Uh, But the case does continue. And people should know that the courts that did hear the merits found the FDA um, has been getting it wrong. They haven't been protecting the public, which is their obligation um, as a federal agency, and that these drugs are inherently dangerous. Yeah, and I, I mean, I appreciate you unpacking that because the danger in those really, I don't want to call them deceptive, but maybe deceptive headlines is that it kind of like normalizes what these poison pills are and just makes them seem like, oh, not that big of a deal. But, you know, they're going through the mail. You don't necess- they're not being administered by a physician. A, a woman's not under the care of a physician. And, you know, in the future, we're going to have um, a local OBGYN uh, OBGYN on, on the show to just kind of really help us understand, you know, what that means, um, just for the, for the sake of the own, for the woman who's ingesting that, um, even if she's not being subject to coercion. So, you know, uh, thanks, thanks for unpacking that Supreme court case there a little bit. Um, just maybe turning back to, you know, boy, some of the fear and coercion, um, here in South Dakota, we've got, uh, amendment G, that is, that is coming up um, on our, our ballot here locally this this coming November. Early voting will start in November. And for a lot of those, for, for a lot of us who are kind of, you know, in the middle, we hear these voices that are really harping at us from from lots of different angles. And we're just trying to, you know, think through like, well, what is this? One of the messages that's coming at us, Katie, is, oh, this is, this is simply restoring Roe. We're just, you know, kind of going back to what was. But very interesting. I was, I was listening to an interview in local media a couple of weeks ago of the proponent of Amendment G. And he acknowledged kind of in this interview of um, actually all of the protections that existed in, in state law, you know, prior to Dobbs, we wouldn't be able to have those anymore. You know, the requirement that a woman have a no kidding bona fide relationship with a doctor, um, counseling, informed consent, anti-coercion, um, uh, but parental note of all this stuff uh, w- wouldn't be the case, which, um, as you've so beautifully described, matters for matters for actual um, women. 
I, I want to talk a little more just about kind of going back to what you were sharing earlier about some of the, the fear and emotional isolation, lack of support. What has been your experience? And, and you've got like this bird's eye perch. You get to see the beautifully see the whole nation. What's been your experience with pregnancy help centers and the work that they do? Well, I think they're absolutely an indispensable uh, resource to women and families. I know um, I follow um, the prayer. There's a prayer text chain from my local pregnancy center. And so I, you know, I read daily what women are coming in and saying, yeah. um, what their concerns are, what their hopes and fears are. And I am just so glad that we have, you know, these thousands of of organizations in addition to the churches and the other civic organizations that partner with them out there. And so a huge goal for our organization. And I think for many of us in the pro-life movement is making sure that women know about those resources and that the people who support them, their family members, the, the parishioners in their churches also know about those resources. Um, you know, I have a very pro-choice friend who's made no bones about letting me know what she thinks about what I do. Um, and her cousin was unexpectedly pregnant. And so this friend called me up and said, hey, do you know of anybody who could help her in where she lives in Michigan? Yeah. And this is not the time where we spike the football and say, hey, yeah, see, we've been doing all these good things. Like, yes, no. let me find out. Um, and I called a few friends I know in that area. I got her connected to um, a local pregnancy center and also um, she was still in school. So we got her connected to um, a, a program where she could finish that year of school from home. Like we all have this opportunity to um, be that, you know, <laughs> voice of the good life mm -hmm. and that support system in, with the people that we know, whether we agree with them politically or not. Um, and I think, you know, when you think about something like Amendment G, many voters say, well, I'm pro-life and, and I don't think abortion is a good thing, um, but maybe it needs to be available for other people. Yeah. Um, what we need to make available for other people is a true support network yeah. that can help them through what they are going through in their life and help them and their children flourish. Yeah. not an abortion that ends the life of the child, creates new problems for mom, whether it's physical or emotional or spiritual, and doesn't help with the problem that brought her to that door in the first place. You know, in my experience too, uh, Katie, my sister used to work at a pregnancy uh, help center, so I had a chance to visit, and it was just beautiful. It was it was beautiful. It was, it was peaceful. They, there was a real... Uh, hospitality. I mean, has that been your experience as you've interacted with pregnancy help centers elsewhere? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the pregnancy centers I've gotten the privilege to tour are so attuned to the needs of their community. Yeah. Um, many of these organizations don't take any government money. And so they are totally um, community funded. And so, you know, here in Florida, where I live, um, I was recently at a center that was talking to me about how um, they serve a huge Spanish speaking population. Increasingly, um, they're serving a Haitian population. And so they hired somebody who speaks fluent Creole so that women, when they're having their ultrasounds, when they're having their counseling, um, it's in their native language. They can really understand it. And I think, you know, that like understanding the needs of your community and responding to it is something that makes uh, the pregnancy center tapestry so rich you know and i want to just maybe pause real quick to, to our listeners wherever you might be across the state of south dakota there's a pregnancy help center uh not far from you and if you want to get in touch with one of them i'm going to do a quick shout out to the alpha center here in sioux falls alpha center is just doing amazing amazing work you can get a hold of them at 605-361-3500 again 605-361-3500 even if you don't live in Sioux Falls, they've got this beautiful like Mercedes mobile unit that's got like the latest medical technology. They'll come out, they, they tour the state, but they can also connect you um, with a, a brick and mortar um, facility that is near you to wherever you are, you know, Watertown, Yankton, Aberdeen, 
and, and places beyond, um, there is a, there's somebody, and, and it's not just, you know, an institution. These are, these are real women kind of answering the phones, working the desks, their, their wives, mothers, grandmothers, sisters, cousins, friends, and they, they want to be in relationship and, and help you sort through whatever it is that, um, that you're going through. Hey, Katie, um, as we've got a couple minutes left here, one of the things that I, I did want to pick your brain on just a little bit is, um, again, for those of us that are kind of just in the middle and, you know, we get all the voices kind of shouting at us from different directions, is um, the views of real Americans. Like, where are Americans at on late-term abortion? And I just want to be really clear with our listeners, that's what Amendment G legalizes. If you vote for Amendment G in South Dakota, you are legalizing a, a late term up to the moment of birth abortion. So just where does that view fall uh, within the span of, you know, our friends and neighbors across the country? Well, I just saw a poll um, from Harvard Harris that said 90 percent of Americans do not support uh, no limits abortion and late term abortion. So we are certainly um, in the overwhelming majority for those of us um, who want to protect life, celebrate life, um, but also for the people who say, um, you know, maybe they don't agree with us completely, but they also don't agree with Amendment G. Yeah. And they would say that goes way too far. Um, so I think it is important, and you, you point out that that distinction that this is not about Roe versus Wade. This would get rid of parental consent. It would mean that women are not owed good counseling and an understanding of what's going on and what their risks are, what their options are. Um, and in fact, this would um, pull the taxpayer into it. Uh, we've seen now in Michigan, they passed Prop 3 in 2022. Um, the ACLU of Michigan is now suing, saying Prop 3 requires the taxpayer to foot the bill for elective abortions. And this is actually something they tried to pass through their legislature last year. It was Democrats who shut it down. They said, you know, we're fine with abortion being available, but taxpayers shouldn't have to pay for it. Uh, something that the vast majority of Americans and I'm sure South Dakotans agree with. Um, and the ACLU said, no, no, we're going to go into court. We're going to make you pay for it yeah. like they've done in Montana and in other states. Um, and so this is certainly something as we talk to voters who say, well, I'm pro-choice, but, you know, maybe only the first trimester. Um, they really, their ears perk up when we say, you want to have to pay for this? Like, do you think your taxes should be paying for this? Um, the vast majority of people say no. And and so this is a real concern, um, I think, with Amendment G to understand is that we want our resources going to help women and families, help them thrive. I know Governor Nome has really been talking about the great opportunities in South Dakota um, not to pay for the destruction of their children. Katie, it's just been a delight to visit. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. To all of our friends and neighbors out there, I'm Chris Motes, and thanks for joining us on this episode of The Good Life.